Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Lyft officially hit the public markets this week, the biggest listing of the year so far. We will break it all down. Plus, Apple meets Hollywood. After months, if not years, of speculation, the iPhone maker unveils its streaming plan with a star studded event from Steven Spielberg to Reese Witherspoon and Oprah. A lot of excitement, but also still a lot of questions. Plus, securing the vote, Congressman Ro Khanna is sounding the call to protect the 2020 elections from foreign interference. We'll discuss his plan about getting it right next year. First to our top story in the biggest listing of the year so far, Lyft hit the public markets this week, now officially trading on the Nasdaq under the ticker Lyft. And investors are watching closely. In the roadshow leading up to the IPO, investors packed a standing room only luncheon to hear the company's pitch, and the offering was oversubscribed. We parsed through all the details right after the company listed. Well, I think it's important to have the context that what we're going after is a trillion dollar market opportunity. Every year in the US, Americans spend $9,000 owning and operating their car and using it only 5% of the time. And so this massive market shift, just like entertainment has gone streaming, uh, is happening with car ownership. And we're investing to take advantage of that. Our economics are improving uh, and uh, we're very confident in the path ahead. So, Logan, in your risk factors, you say you may never be profitable. I mean, how do you convince investors that they should be betting on the the optimistic here? (laughs) If, if you dig in on the numbers, every year the economics of the business improve, and we are confident that the business will be very profitable. Uh, there are, of course, risk factors, but we are making tremendous progress going after this you know, once-in-a-generation shift where this entire industry, potentially, a $1.2 trillion market could flip from an ownership model to a service model, and we're leading the way there. So John, let me put it this way. If you focus on margins one day, does that give Uber an opportunity to claw back market share another day? We're not focused on our competition, we're focused on what we control. And so every day we're thinking about how to serve our drivers and passengers, build a long-term model, uh, pushing down our operating costs and like this driver center, the operating costs of our drivers. And and that's what's allowed us to go from just over 20% market share two years ago to nearly 40% market share. We don't focus on market share. Uh, we just execute uh, and serve our, our constituents. Is getting to 50% market share in the U.S. more important than expanding internationally, Logan? Our, our focus is always on taking care of our customer. So we don't set market share goals. We focus on delivering the world's best transportation to our customers. And so we do think about international. Every year we sit down and we make the trade-off. Can we go deeper on this $1.2 trillion market in the U.S. and deliver better transportation to our customers here? Or is it time to go abroad? And so a little over a year ago, we launched Canada, and that's been a great experience for us. Uh, And we'll continue to consider international opportunities. I think it's sort of a great call option, Uh, but right now... What do you mean by a great call option? You know, I think it's, it's a great... There are many future growth opportunities in this business, whether we're going deeper in North America or going international. So we look at that as as a call option for the business, uh, and we may choose to do that someday, but we don't have current plans right now. Let's talk about founder control. You have a lot of voting power, almost 50% voting power, but you hold 5% of shares, and there was a lot of backlash when this came out. What's your argument that that's the best way to govern this company? Yeah, we put a lot of thought into this with our board and a lot of our investors, and we really wanted to set the company up to go after the long term and make the right investments to seize this long term opportunity. We think that's going to be necessary to deliver the largest shareholder returns over time. And so dual class was an important piece of it. We designed it, you know, John and I together still have less than majority control. We uh, selected an independent chair, Sean Argawal uh, has stepped in as the independent chair of the, the Lyft board. And we have, I think, an incredible board from a diverse set of backgrounds set up to guide the company. And we think collectively that's the right package. But there are concerns, John, that this won't lead to the appropriate checks and balances you need on a public company. And we've seen situations at Google and Facebook where founder-led decisions were made 
that maybe weren't the best decisions. How do you respond to that? I respond by saying we've been balanced in how we've We've uh, put this together, as Logan mentioned, we have an independent chair, we have a diverse board, we have a great uh, broad set of shareholders, uh, and uh, you know, when, when we talk to our investors, we let them know that we care deeply about their views, care deeply about incorporating them, and our, and our track record shows that. You've been investing heavily in self-driving technology. How much and how fast do you think self-driving technology will bring your costs down? I think we're still years away from self-driving. How many years? I, I, I wish I knew myself. <laughs> uh, I don't, but you know, I, I think there's, there's kind of a conception that there's gonna be a magical self-driving vehicle that'll appear one day uh, and do every ride. But the way we see it playing out from all of our work in the space is that the first generation of vehicles will only be able to do a subset of the rides. So I think it'll be critical that they're rolled out on a platform like ours where you can count on drivers to fulfill every request, right? It may be a long time for security reasons before an, auton an empty autonomous vehicle is allowed to do a pickup at an airport, let alone drive in extreme weather, drive at night, drive at certain speeds, through bridges and tunnels. There's all sorts of restrictions that the first generation of vehicles will have. So I think a, a network application uh, for deploying self-driving cars will be the you know, majority case for the years to come. Then, in the meantime, John, you know, I know you're very focused on changing trends in, in car ownership, but in many cities where Lyft and Uber are big operators, you're actually seeing an increase in cars on the road. You're seeing more concession. You're actually seeing more car ownership. What evidence have you seen that car ownership trends are actually changing? Well, I think actually we've seen like peak, peak car ownership and uh, if you look at the national numbers, you look at uh, people that are purchasing or deciding not to purchase. If you look at uh, millennials that are coming of age and waiting or not getting their license. Um, and if you look at our growth, uh, I think there's uh, you know a pretty obvious trend. Last year, uh, over 300,000 Lyft customers got rid of a car. Uh, and so uh, some families are going from two car to one car, but it is it has begun. In your roadshow, you really talked about how you don't do food delivery, you don't do trucking. Lyft is about focus. That said, you are getting into to new businesses, scooters, for example. What is going to be your biggest source of new revenue in the future? Will it be scooters, Logan? Will it be international expansion? Will it be something we don't know about? We, we compete with car ownership. So when you open up the Lyft app, we want to provide you every possible option that you could be trading on whether that's public transit or connecting you with a lift to public transit, whether it's a bike or a scooter, a shared ride, a regular lift, a luxury ride. We want to provide you with any possible option. So we see competing with the car that's parked in your driveway as, as the primary goal. And speaking up about the future of drivers, you know, I know self-driving technology is very important. It is long-term, as you say. But so much of Lyft has been about the values, treating customers well, treating drivers well. If you're investing in self-driving technology, doesn't that mean all of those jobs go away? And doesn't that sort of undermine those? No, I, I don't think those jobs go away at all. In fact, we're going to need many more drivers over the next several years. Think about today, uh, the entire ride-sharing market in the U.S. does just 1% of miles traveled. As that goes to 10% of miles traveled, you would need either 10 times the number of drivers. If we had 2 million, nearly 2 million drivers now, uh, we're talking 20 million drivers. Obviously, there's room for both increasing the number of work opportunities and uh, adding uh, autonomous vehicles. So where's Lyft in five years? In five years? In five years. In five years, we want you to be subscribing to a package of miles. So similar to the way you have a, you have a cell phone and you subscribe to a number of minutes, we want people to completely get rid of their car and jump into the world of transportation as a service and subscribe to Miles so that you don't have to think about each trip. You're just fully on board in the Lyft ecosystem. So something like Lyft Prime, is this like a monthly thing, a yearly thing? It, it'll still have to take shape, but I, I, I think people will be subscribing to, to Miles. Boeing says it was very close to a software fix for its 737 MAX jetliner when an Ethiopian Airlines jet crashed on March 10th. The plane maker has spent months working with regulators and refining the plane's software. Flight data from the October crash of a Lion Air jet in Indonesia showed the system had repeatedly tipped the nose down, 
before pilots lost control. A Boeing executive said the upgrade proved more complicated than the manufacturer initially estimated. Lawmakers pressed the acting administrator of the FAA at a hearing this week about its oversight of Boeing as the plane maker remains under scrutiny. Coming up, Apple goes Hollywood. It's planned to take on Netflix, Amazon, and Disney in the streaming world. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. After weeks, months, actually years of chatter, Apple finally revealed it is all in as a services company on Monday. The iPhone maker unveiled a news magazine service, a new video gaming platform, and with a parade of Hollywood elite from Jennifer Aniston to Steve Carell and, yes, Oprah, a new premium video service to rival the likes of Netflix and Amazon. Take a listen to CEO Tim Cook. Our vision for Apple TV app is to bring together your favorite shows, movies, sports, and news, and make them available on all of your devices. So you can spend less time looking for something to watch and more time enjoying it. And perhaps the key to it all, Apple's brand new credit card in partnership with Goldman Sachs to facilitate payment for all of these new monthly buy-ins. The card is tied to Apple Pay, which eMarketer claims has been adopted by 39% of mobile payment users just behind the Starbucks app. To discuss all of this news from Cupertino, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who covers Apple and was on the ground for all the announcements, joined us Monday along with Technalysis Research President Bob O'Donnell. We knew which shows were coming every time that a new show went into development or was closing in on filming, Apple or the producers and actors and actresses involved would very publicly announce these deals. We knew that this was going to be some sort of subscription service. We knew it would be premium. We knew it would be high end. What we didn't know were two basic things. How much would they charge for it? And we didn't know which devices it would be supported on. Now, Apple didn't come right out and say it. But my sense is that these shows are going to be available on the Samsung, Sony, Vizio, and LG TVs, in addition to the Amazon and Roku boxes, besides Apple's devices. But no word on if these are going to be on Amazon and Android, of course, phones and tablets. We also didn't know price. They didn't really talk about the price. I'm not sure they're 100% certain what the price is going to be. And they didn't really discuss pricing for the Apple channels. And by the way, same name as Amazon channels for the same basic feature. So we'll be waiting on those. That's what investors care about, prices and, and the comparison to Netflix and Amazon Prime. Right. So Apple also offering a bundle of TV channels, which will include HBO, Showtime, Stars. Bob, they obviously pulled out all the stops with this announcement today. Well, clearly they and did. It was really cool, and it, and it shows the amount of priority that they're pushing, putting on these new services. Absolutely. And it was a big, splashy event, which Apple's very good at. And they do demo reels and splash things to get you super excited. But the question is, how are we going to feel about it tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, to Mark's point, we're going to go, wait a minute, like, you know, what exactly are we going to get from this? Because there are plenty of other options to get everything except Apple's original content. And so really, it's going to boil down to how compelling can they make this total package, not just from a feature perspective, but from a pricing perspective. So the lack of pricing to me was very disappointing, and I think many other people as well. You know, and ironically, I, I don't think the TV service was actually the biggest announcement or the best announcement of the day. I think it was the credit card. The credit card is, is kind of a big deal. Let's take a listen to Jennifer Bailey, the vice president of Apple Pay, who unveiled this credit card in the partnership with Goldman Sachs, MasterCard, also a part of it. Listen up. And any time you pay using Apple Card, you get daily cash. Not a month from now, but every day. So every day you spend, cash is added to your Apple Cash card, which is also in the wallet app. And it's cash, like real cash. So you can do anything with it. Every time you pay with your iPhone or Apple Watch, you'll get 2% of the purchase amount in daily cash. 
So aside from Oprah, that was actually my favorite line of the entire event. <laughs> it's cash, like real cash, Mark. This is something that we weren't necessarily expecting. Apple is getting into the credit card business, trying to change the credit card business. And actually, a lot of things they're offering make a lot of sense. And consumers are probably going to be pretty excited about this. I mean, no fees, no late fees. Yeah, they hit a lot of the pain points here. One of the foreign transaction fees, the late fees, the annual fee. I'm a credit card buff, and you know you could cycle through tons of credit cards to get the best sign-up bonuses and different cash back percentages to optimize in spending. But what we're seeing here is 2% flat rate through Apple Pay, and that's actually the highest in the industry from what I believe for a flat rate, but that's only from using it with your phone. So places that you have the physical card, which by the way, of course, looks like it comes right from Apple with the titanium and the laser etching, is only 1%. So if you're in an environment where you have lots of Apple Pay around you and you want a high cash back, I don't really think there's a better card on the market for this, but there's other cards that have better optimization for depending on places you're using the card. So Bob, how impactful do you think this card could be given that the hope for Apple is that you're, you're charging a lot of your new Apple services on this credit card? Well, obviously, I, I think it's going to take a while. Like People have to get used to paying with their phones. Still, that's why we see adoption still relatively modest. But, you know, the, the joke I made with a couple of folks is it, the, the credit card proves that Apple's still best at hardware because that was the coolest thing of the event was the actual hardware. I mean, you know, having a card with no numbers and everything else, it, it totally reshapes the way you think about credit cards and the app that goes with it. I mean, that to me was Apple at its very best. Taking something that's hard, has pain points, and then making it simple through the Apple magic. And the question is, how many other industries and capabilities are we going to see Apple do this on down the road? To me, that's going to be a bigger story long term. But I thought they did a great job of, of showing off how you deal with paying off things and, and things that people want to know, real, real world people. So let's talk about something we do know the price of, and that is the news subscription service, $9.99 a month. This, of course, is building on what Apple has already done in news, but, you know, attempting to make it bigger. Take a listen to Apple's vice president of apps, Roger Rosner. Over 300 great magazines, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, those great premium digital subscriptions. There's literally never been an offer like this before. If you were to subscribe to all of these individually, it would cost you over $8,000 per year. But with Apple News Plus, you pay $9.99 per month. Now, if you look at the subscription price for the Wall Street Journal alone, it is over $20 a month. So make sense of this for me, Mark. Yeah, there's some debate online. Apple is telling some people that you get full access to the Wall Street Journal, whereas the Wall Street Journal sent out a memo earlier today from its CEO indicating the subscription service would not cover the journal in its totality, that some business news would be exclusive to people paying that higher subscription rate directly from the journal. So until that's sorted out, can't really you know comment completely on that. But I think Apple's probably going to get its way here. That's what they're telling people. I think that's what's going to happen. So, Bob, you know, these magazines, I mean, they, the, they look amazing on, on the iPad, but, you know, you're talking about an industry that's already resource starved. Do these magazines and, and newspapers actually have the staff to build out an entirely new Apple app experience to, 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 to make it worth it? it? It's a great question, Emily. And, you know, look, they, like you said, they showed some great demos again, as Apple does with the, the floating city video on the cover of National Geographic and all these cool things that brought the magazines to life. But there's a lot of work involved in making those happen. And, you know, people have had the opportunity to get digital magazines before. And it hasn't really become a huge business. So I think this is a good thing that Apple is doing. I think it's interesting. I'm not sure it's a huge hit in terms of an economic uh, impact. I mean, the idea of it is certainly Absolutely. attractive. It's right? attractive. But again, there have been, you know, Apple bought a company that was essentially offering this service before. Now, mind you, they weren't Apple, and, and that does change things quite a bit. But it, it, there is a question mark of how much they're really going to get from the Wall Street Journal, as Mark pointed out, and, and from these other magazines, how long they can sustain the interactive versions of their magazines, and frankly, how many people are willing to pay for that, despite the supposed value, because at most, you're going to read a couple of them anyway. Mm -hmm. That's all anybody could possibly do. That was Technalysis's Bob O'Donnell and Bloomberg's own Mark Gurman. Meantime, YouTube is said to have canceled its plans for a slate of high-end dramas and comedies. The move is a step back from the company's designs on a paid service that features Hollywood-quality shows. 
Bloomberg has learned the decision is reportedly due to the high cost it would take to compete with the deeply entrenched players like Netflix and Amazon and now, of course, Apple. And without it, YouTube is still making a lot of money the old-fashioned way. Ads. And we will stay on Apple ahead this week's conflicting decisions in the long-running patent dispute between Apple and Qualcomm. This is Bloomberg. Just one day after Apple's big services event, the iPhone maker barely escaped a possible import ban on its iconic smartphones. The U.S. International Trade Commission rejected a patent infringement claim filed by Qualcomm Tuesday. Apple, though, is not out of the woods. That decision came just hours after a separate ITC judge said Apple infringed a different Qualcomm patent and recommended an iPhone ban. That case is subject to review by the full commission, which is expected to complete that investigation by July. On Tuesday, we spoke with Gene Munster, co-founder of Loop Ventures, right after the decisions came out. So it's going to play out over these small uh, bumps in the road, the small roller coaster ride, inevitably, country by country, unfortunately. And I think to put some context on this, these headlines sound uh, most concerning. Sound is, I think, the important word there. The substance is this is just purely noise. And ultimately, to answer your question, how does this play out? We are going to see some varying degrees of announcements, both for Qualcomm and for Apple. But that doesn't change where the trajectory of the relationship between Apple and Qualcomm is going. And that relationship is moving in a different direction where they will eventually be separate. And you can point to some of the hires that Apple has had more recently in San Diego, similar to an acquisition they did about a decade ago where they started to build their own chips internally and vertically integrate. They want to do the same thing around technology that they currently license or are in dispute with around Qualcomm. So they have an option of moving in that direction. So the big picture, the simple reason why this is noise is that in the future, Apple is not going to be dependent on Qualcomm. And this only this irritation that is going on in the courts only accelerates that move for Apple. The iPhone has been banned in other countries in other rulings pertaining to Qualcomm. I know that it, it mostly involves older models. So even if it's just older models potentially being banned, you think that's still just noise? It is. And I think uh, there's some dispute about which models under this most recent announcement are going to be banned. Uh, Apple uh, uses Intel chips uh, for their most uh, recent phones. So most likely, to your point, it's going to be for some of the older phones if you think about the simple exposure to Apple's business, let's say that uh, the phones of kind of the iPhone 7 and before are banned in the U.S. and those customers don't purchase any Apple products, that probably has kind of a 5% headwind to the overall Apple business. So it is a measurable uh, piece of the business. But importantly, I think I just come back to the central theme is that uh, these customers likely uh, are not going to make a decision based on uh, a price point that's unavailable for them for 50 or or $100 to jump to an Android phone. Apple has uh, retention that has been steady for the iPhone between 90 and 95 percent over the past five years. And I think that, uh, that uh, availability or lack thereof of certain models isn't going to materially change that number in the near term. Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster there. Coming up, can the U.S. government safeguard the 2020 presidential election from foreign influence? And what is Silicon Valley's role? We will hear from Congressman Ro Khanna about his plan to ensure they work together. That is next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election is wrapped, though political fights may continue. And there is still plenty of work to do ahead of the 2020 presidential vote. Congressman Ro Khanna of California has laid out what he believes needs to be done in a Washington Post op-ed, writing, quote, 
Completely preventing the injection of foreign government propaganda into our discourse is impossible, but we can ask our tech industry to reduce the amplification of such messages and more quickly detect, quarantine, and report organized foreign influence efforts to U.S. officials. Congressman Connor joined us from Capitol Hill on Tuesday. As Bob Mueller found, the Russians hacked uh, into our emails. Uh, they manipulated social media. They clearly wanted Donald Trump to win. We need to make sure that whether it's the Russians or any other foreign country, they never do that again. And there's some very simple things we can do. First, uh, technology companies can form a consortium so they can share information about bots or bad actors and make sure those actors are removed from those platforms. Second, our law enforcement agencies can better coordinate with tech companies. I mean, tech companies don't have all the resources to do all the intelligence work. They need to be working with law enforcement. And a third point, uh, we need to label these ads. A, a consumer needs to know, are they seeing an ad that's been paid for by a foreign entity? And who is actually behind these online ads? Is there anything that Congress can do legislatively to make sure, though, that that coordination happens between the U.S. government and U.S. intelligence and these tech companies? I mean, it seems like a lot is just falling through the cracks. We can. Uh, we can uh, give funding to uh, these law enforcement agencies to specifically help uh, private companies with cybersecurity and with uh, fighting foreign interference. Uh, we do this all the time, right? I mean, we don't expect Facebook to be responsible so solely for their security. They may have private security, but they still have the protection of our military and police forces. Well, they should also have the assistance from our intelligence agencies to help them identify who the bad actors are on their platforms. Then they have a responsibility, of course, to remove those bad actors or to make sure they aren't spreading propaganda. Uh, this actually is also a bipartisan issue. I've talked to people on the other side of the aisle uh, about the need for Congress to step in uh, to make sure this doesn't happen again. So, you know, we just saw this live video of a mass shooting in New Zealand go up on Facebook's platform. Nobody caught it for 17 long minutes, and it certainly sort of diminishes faith in the ability of the tech industry to take strong action on some of these things. I mean, do you think we're really better prepared now than we were in 2016 to prevent this kind of interference from happening on tech platforms? I do think we're better prepared. I've spoken to many tech leaders and they've taken this and do take this very seriously. And they have uh, instituted far greater safeguards into their platforms to make sure that they're ready to act. I mean, you mentioned the uh, New Zealand shooting, which was just atrocious and awful. Uh, and it took maybe a few hours to remove uh, the video from every site, but it's a hard problem because once the video is out there, if it has over a million shares, it's not easy uh, for anyone to remove it. Uh, so we have to understand that this is a difficult issue uh, and it's going to require investment in artificial intelligence. It's going to require better coordination. Uh, but I do think that the many of the leaders understand their responsibility. Do you think big tech gets how big an issue this is and do you think there's there's truly the will there to invest the human and technological resources to make this happen i do i mean they're citizens of our democracy and they understand and want uh, these platforms to enhance democracy when you speak to them they'll talk about how proud they are of the black lives matter or parkland kids having uh, social media as a platform to get their voice out or how much they were excited about the arab spring but they also understand that these platforms have been abused for hate crimes, for suppressing votes, for the awful human rights violations in Myanmar. So they want to solve this. What they say, though, is they can't do it alone. They need the help of uh, law enforcement agencies uh, and they need the help of the government to invest in resources. That said, they have uh, a responsibility and there are things they can do themselves, such as disclosures of ads, such as making sure that uh, they limit the virality uh, of propaganda or hate speech. Meantime, big tech is sort of getting bipartisan scrutiny of late. Uh, Democratic presidential candidate Senator Elizabeth Warren calling for the breakup of, of big tech. Senator Ted Cruz supporting her on that. Do you think that's the right way to go? I don't agree uh, with them on that. I don't want China to have the only 
uh, big tech companies. I mean, it would be a irony if Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu were uh, dominating the world. I do think we need stronger antitrust protection. I think the paradigm should be the Microsoft case. There, the government said Microsoft couldn't privilege its own product. It couldn't tie Internet Explorer. Uh, and uh, they prohibited that, but they did not break Microsoft up. That seems to have worked well. It led to the rise of Netscape, of Google. Uh, and we see in technology that the giants of the past, uh, like AOL or Yahoo, uh, are often not the giants of the future. So strong antitrust protection, yes. Uh, just breaking up big companies, no. What kind of antitrust protection would you advocate on Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook? Well, what I would say is you shouldn't have anti-competitive platform privilege. And putting that simply, it means you shouldn't be able to prioritize your own products. Let's take a, a concrete example. Amazon shouldn't be able to uh, say that when you go search for a detergent you want to buy, that the first things you'll see uh, is Amazon Basics. They should make sure that uh, every competitor has equal access to their platforms, not biasing their own products. I think those type of reasonable uh, steps and strengthening antitrust uh, law is a good thing. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that uh, uh, we break up these companies into multi parts and then allow uh, uh, Alibaba to, to uh, succeed and become the world's platform. So you represent Silicon Valley. Have any of these tech giants or the executives at these companies reached out to you personally to express their concerns about government interference or regulation? Well, I have conversations with them all the time, and there are times where uh, they think uh, I'm going too far with my Internet Bill of Rights or even talking about stronger antitrust uh, 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 enforcement. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they respect that because it, it's intellectually defensible. What they don't uh, like uh, is just painting with broad brush brushes and uh, uh, just a, a, a politics of demonization. Ultimately, tech remains very, very popular when you go around the country. People like using tech products. They want tech jobs. They want smart regulation. But I think Tim Cook has said it best. What we need is well-crafted regulation. So, you know, as you said at the top, Mueller's investigation have, has wrapped. We have the attorney general's summary of it. Are you satisfied with that? Or do you want the full report to be released to, to the public? And do you think at this point Congress should move on? We definitely need the full report uh, released to the public. The American taxpayers paid for the report. We should see the report. And we particularly need to see the report on obstruction of justice. I mean, Bob Mueller, after two years, didn't make a conclu conclusion about whether the president obstructed justice. Uh, who is Bill Barr to make that, that kind of conclusion in 36 hours? If Mueller wanted Bill Barr to make the conclusion, he would have used that in his report. The fact is, Mueller wanted the American people to make that conclusion. He wanted Congress to make that conclusion. We need to see the full report. That was Congressman Ro Khanna of California's 17th District. Well, Amazon plans to hire an additional 800 engineers in Austin, Texas. It is the company's first major U.S. office expansion since backing out of a corporate campus in New York. Amazon says it will distribute the 25,000 jobs formerly bound for the Big Apple, and they'll be broken out among 17 R&D offices around North America. Coming up, regulating Google, CEO Sundar Pichai met President Trump this week to ease concerns the administration has over the search giant and its practices. But is it enough to keep individual states happy? We asked the Attorney General of Louisiana. That is next. This is Bloomberg. On Wednesday, President Trump met with Google CEO Sundar Pichai. According to the president, they talked about Google's efforts in China and its work with the U.S. military, a meeting that the president tweeted went well. But despite the positive sentiment, Google and its parent company Alphabet are still being targeted by lawmakers. Senator Elizabeth Warren has called for Google's breakup. Senator Ted Cruz claims Google silences conservative voices. And Bloomberg has previously reported that a group of state attorneys general are laying the groundwork for a probe into Google on the basis of antitrust and privacy concerns. We talked about all of this with the attorney general of the state of Louisiana, Jeff Landry, on Thursday. I wasn't privileged to the discussion that the president uh, had. 
And I would guess that it mainly surrounded uh, Google's activity in China. I, I don't know, I haven't heard that they discussed any of its uh, practices as it relates to data mining, the use of data mining, the manipulation in the digital ad space, uh, and, and content suppression, all of which you mentioned earlier. So what we have here are different layers of problems all surrounding big tech as a whole. And these are issues that attorney generals around the country on both sides of the aisle have been discussing for quite some time now. This is not new to us. This is a discussion that we, we have been having uh, as we not only are the chief legal officers of each of our particular states, but we also are tasked with protecting consumers in each of our states. What are the issues that you are most concerned about and what kind of action do you think needs to be taken? Well, I think, I think all of the issues that have been brought up concern me equally. I would tell you that each of them have a different take. Some of them have an antitrust avenue. Others have an unfair trade practices avenue as well. Uh, we were scheduled to discuss some of these issues with the FTC last week. That meeting has been postponed and my understanding is they're rapidly trying to reschedule that particular meeting. You know, when it comes to the digital advertising space, that I'll give you that as an example, could be both an antitrust and an unfair uh, trade practice area. So are you part of this inquiry that I mentioned where attorneys general are now looking into uh, whether Google warrants a probe on antitrust and privacy issues? Uh, look, we have we have had a number of discussions uh, with additional attorney generals, again, on both sides of the aisle. Each of us are looking at some of the same things and some additional issues where you, you mentioned content suppression as well. Uh, we are absolutely looking at big tech as a whole to determine what avenues may be appropriate in ensuring that our consumers are protected. Google has you know, responded to this preliminary exploration saying privacy and security are built into all of our products and we will continue to engage constructively with state attorneys general on policy issues. You know, Republicans and conservatives ha have historically not wanted to regulate big business. How serious do you think conservatives are right now about regulating big tech and what makes this situation different? from historical situations? Well, first of all, let's not confuse what Google said. Of course, Google, as well as everyone else out there in the industry that collects data on consumers, is concerned about the privacy of that particular data. That is not at all um, uh, what the bigger picture of what attorney generals around the country are looking at. The question to Google is, what are you doing with the data that you're collecting? Does the consumer know what you're collecting on them? Are they getting the benefit? Is there a quid pro quo in that? And should consumers be getting more out of what you're collecting from them? On top of that is, is the data that you are, that Google is collecting from the consumer, is that proprietary to the consumer? That's one particular field. Then the next question is whether or not Google is manipulating the digital ad space. Are they controlling it in a way that basically would be unfair? You know, when you look at the big picture in the digital advertising space, the question I would pose is, would the FTC allow Chase or Goldman Sachs to own the NASDAQ? The answer to that would be absolutely not. They wouldn't allow them to own the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Yet that's exactly what Google does in the advertising, in the digital advertising space. So what do you think about privacy then in particular and what role states should play in enforcing a federal privacy bill? Well, again, the question when you talk about privacy, you know, that's that's a very broad subject. Are you talking about whether, you know, how individual companies protect the data that they already have? Or are you talking about being open and transparent with the consumer as to what you're collecting from them? Now, when it comes to political bias, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, when he was Attorney General last year, called a meeting of you and your peers to talk about 
conservative bias on tech platforms. Do you believe some of these tech platforms are deliberately subverting conservative voices? Well, I could tell you that the, that some of the actions that I've seen on the big tech platform certainly raise that particular issue. Uh, the question, I, I have seen it, uh, we have seen it time and time again when they have suppressed conservative content. We report it to them, we take action or ask them about it or inquiry. And of course, it's always an apology from their standpoint. But again, at some point in time, uh, when the mistake is made again and again and again, there becomes evidence that there is content suppression. I think that the, the concern that Senator Ted Cruz has has raised is uh, could be real. And that's what we're hoping to find out. Speaking of Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Elizabeth Warren, both of them, Elizabeth Warren has advocated for the breakup of big tech. Uh, Ted Cruz has said, well, she has a good point. What you just said about not wanting Goldman or J.P. Morgan to own the Nasdaq sort of sort of reminds me of that. I mean, what do you make of their arguments to break up big tech? Look, it's certainly it's certainly a possibility. I think it may be a road that may have to be traveled on. Uh, I think that attorney generals around the country are leaving all of the tools in the toolbox in an effort to try to cure some of the problems that we're seeing. Uh, You know, again, we're talking about a virtual marketplace that the average consumer has a hard time wrapping their heads around. But when again, when you go to the digital ad space, look, I'll give you an example. Uh, I I was trying to purchase a, a cover for a dog bed that I have. I had this large lap. He destroyed his dog bed. I didn't need the mattress. I just needed the cover. I went into the field and searched dog cover and the manufacturer. What I got on the first page was that the covers were all out of stock and I'd have to buy the entire bed. Knowing what goes on in a digital marketplace, I went to the second and third page and found the cover I was looking for. The question is, is Google purposely doing that? Are they driving consumer, consumers to more expensive avenues that they're not exactly looking for? Consumers have come to have an expectation that when you search for a particular uh, product, that that product, uh, that what they're getting is quality and, co- and maybe quantity and service. And that's what we're trying to determine, whether or not the consumer's expectation is meeting what's, what, what eventually comes out of the search. That was Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry. Coming up, another federal agency targeting Facebook. This time, it's housing and urban development, alleging the social network's ad platform is discriminatory. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Facebook is already the target of the Federal Trade Commission for privacy violations. And on Thursday, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development said it is charging the social network with allegedly violating the Fair Housing Act. HUD says that Facebook did so by restricting those who view housing-related ads on the basis of things like race and religion. Here's what Housing Secretary Ben Carson said in a statement. Facebook is discriminating against people based upon who they are and where they live. Using a computer to limit a person's housing choices can be just as discriminatory as slamming a door in someone's face. We discuss the case with Bloomberg's Selena Wang and Naomi Nix. It's definitely caught Facebook off guard. Just last week, they actually settled several lawsuits with civil rights groups like the ACLU, the Fair Housing Alliance, saying that they were going to overhaul their ad platform so that advertisers of housing or employment-related ads would not be able to do this sort of micro-targeting on the basis of areas like gender and sex. Now, HUD is arguing that that doesn't go far enough, and they're charging that Facebook still allows these discriminatory ads to exist. They even allege that that there was the ability for advertisers to target based on where they lived by drawing a red line around these areas. Also alleging that Facebook uses online data as well as offline data to able to figure out with machine learning what these characteristics of these people are based on these protected groups, like on the basis of race, gender, sex, even if they're not explicitly allowed to target those groups. Now, Facebook statement, we're surprised by HUD's decision as we've been working with them to address their concerns and have taken significant steps to prevent ads discrimination. Last year, we eliminated thousands of targeting options that could potentially be misused. We're disappointed by today's developments, but we'll continue working with civil rights experts on these issues. Um, 
by the way, Naomi, Facebook a couple of weeks ago actually changed a bunch of their ad targeting practices because of complaints around these issues. They say they worked with civil rights groups to make those changes, which is part of the reason Facebook seems to be so caught off guard. Why is uh, the, the HUD taking, taking this action? Well, I think it's just you know another symptom of uh, Washington regulars continuing to ask questions about the social media companies' targeted advertising policies. House Democrats, now that they've taken control of the House, you know, have made it clear that they are intending to seek uh, more answers to questions about whether targeted advertising on Facebook and other social media companies, um, you know, is discriminating against minority communities. And so, I think it's clear that Washington, uh, as uh, as as the HUD secretary made it clear in this move, but Washington in general um, is putting the heat on Facebook around this issue. When you look a little bit more closely, Selena, at the categories that advertisers were allowed to tick or not tick, parents, non-American, non-Christian, interested in accessibility and Hispanic culture. You know, it's interesting thinking about sort of what was going into these product decisions, ad product decisions by Facebook and why they thought this was a good idea. And it's also interesting because these policies are only as good as their enforcements and Facebook isn't required to hand over their algorithms. So clearly there was some sort of data mechanism going on that told them these are interesting targeted groups that would actually be very beneficial to advertisers and get them more clicks. All right, uh, the government has also reached out to Google and Twitter about their ad targeting practices. We've got a statement from Google saying, we've had policies in place for many years that prohibit targeting ads on the basis of sensitive categories like race, ethnicity, religious beliefs, disability status, negative financial standing, etc. Our policies are designed to protect users and ensure advertisers are using our platforms in a responsible manner. Naomi, is there any indication that Google's targeting practices are vastly different from Facebook or, or how the government may proceed in, in, in these other two cases? Well, I think it's clear that, you know, Google says it's not discriminating uh, in the same way. Um, but it's clear that, you know, Google hasn't also been as open with its algorithms and the behind the scenes mechanism it uses to determine its advertising. And more access to that kind of information um, has been a top concern uh, here in Washington. And so I think it remains to be seen whether there are ways um, that Google isn't certifying uh, internally that uh, those advertisements are compliant uh, with housing discrimination law. NASA's historic all-female spacewalk has been put on hold, all because of a lack of fitted spacesuits. Astronauts Anne McLean and Christina Koch were scheduled to swap out batteries outside the International Space Station this week to conclude Women's History Month. But according to the agency, both need a medium-sized spacesuit torso and only one is readily available. Koch will now be accompanied by astronaut Nick Haig. Meantime, NASA spokeswoman Stephanie Shireholds told the Washington Post that an all-female spacewalk is inevitable. It better be. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco, and we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.